All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from a sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Randy Conley, who's also in, a, in sunny San Diego. How are you doing, Randy? I'm doing great, John. It's great to be with you again. Yeah, absolutely. And Randy is the vice president and trust practice leader for Blanchard. He's the co-author of Blanchard's Building Trust Training Program and works with leaders and organizations around the globe, helping them build and restore trust in the workplace. Also co-authored the book, Simple Truths of Leadership, 50 way, 52 Ways to Be a Servant Leader and Build Trust, and is a contributing author to three other books, including Leading at a Higher Level with Ken Blanchard. And his award-winning Leading with Trust blog has influenced 4 million viewers and counting. And that's what we're going to talk about today is building trust. And one of the things I wanted to ask you right out of the gate, uh, Randy, I mean, trust has always been important, right? Uh, but why is it that Today, it seems like it's almost coming back into, in, I would say coming back into vogue, uh, but it really seems to be something that people are, are looking at more, talking about more, are feeling more, to be honest. Yeah, definitely in the limelight uh, more the last several years than in previous times. And sadly, John, I think it's because we have a crisis of untrustworthy leaders. You mm -hmm. know, we... Uh, we've seen the negative effects of untrustworthy leadership for years and in all sectors of society. Sure. I'm not pinpointing any mm -hmm. one area, uh, but we see it in the news all the time. And I think uh, it's just really highlighted the absence of good, trustworthy, effective leadership. And um, so it's just in the news every day. And mm -hmm. in a sense, it's good that people are recognizing the need for more trustworthy leadership. No, absolutely. I mean, and especially now, given the given that people have a lot more flexibility in mm -hmm. terms of employment terms, who they work with, yeah. uh, you know, with people being able to work virtually and remote and all of that, and mm -hmm. you know, go out be contractors. So it seems to me like. The onus is really now on leadership to earn that trust. Like, why should I come to you as opposed to somebody else? Yeah, that's very true. I think in years past, leaders had the expectation that just by virtue of my title or position mm -hmm. that you should trust me, right? I'm the leader. You're the employee. I should be trusted. Uh, so just let's get on with it. And I've thought of... Uh, the pandemic and sort of the post pandemic years as this great trust experiment, mm. you know, where literally overnight organizations and leaders had to show an immense amount of trust in their people, right? We're sending you all to work remotely. We trust you to do the best you can to keep the business running. And by and large, it was pretty darn successful, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And it, brought in this new dynamic in the workplace of people feeling what it's like to be trusted. Yeah. Right. And, and given autonomy and a freedom and, and over the last couple of years as, as organizations have been trying to claw some of that back with getting people back in the office, people are saying, Oh, that doesn't feel so good. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and it's really interesting what you say there because as you said, everybody sent everybody remote, so leaders had to trust. So it's an interesting experience because um, up to then, obviously, when when organizations had everybody together in a building, they kind of at least they had the percent leaders had the perception of having control and they could trust their people. They were, but now they so it's the leaders were the first ones who had to learn relearn this trust right. thing of suddenly like I don't have people are spread out I have to I have to trust that they're going to do the right things I have to set the right expectations obviously right. but it must it's an interesting it's an interesting dichotomy that it's almost like the leaders had to learn to trust first yes absolutely and that illustrates a a key dynamic about trust and that is in order for trust to grow in a relationship, one party has to first extend trust to mm -hmm. the other. Until one party extends trust, you're just at a standstill, right? Um, 
And I believe it's leaders who have mm -hmm. to take the risk of extending trust to their people. Um, and, and we don't do that, you know, willy nilly. We yeah, just yeah, don't yeah. blanketly extend trust. We make educated um, decisions on the mm -hmm. trustworthiness of the people that we're giving trust to. So, um, yeah, so when you trusting smartly. Yeah, and how do uh, how do leaders start to communicate that trust? Right, what? How do they make that first impression of where you would say, okay, I mean, I don't know this person, I'm not going to trust them fully right now, but I like where they're coming from. Yeah, yeah, I think there's a few key actions that signal that trust from leaders to others. One is letting go of control at appropriate. Mm levels. Um, most people, when they think of the opposite of trust, they think of distrust or mistrust, right? Mm -hmm. The reality is the opposite of trust is control, right? Right, And it gets back to that issue of so we have to relinquish control, trust others, and make ourselves vulnerable to them. And so I think finding ways to demonstrably give up control uh, is one thing that leaders can do. Yeah. And, and you also, and, yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to come back for a moment to the vulnerability one because I think, I think sometimes that one is misunderstood and, and, uh, and it, and people go, Ooh, vulnerability, that sounds like I don't, to open myself up yeah. to everybody but it's not it's more like i always say to people like i i trust experts more when they tell me that they don't know something yeah as opposed to when they tell me that they know everything yeah 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 vulnerability in in the sense that we're talking about mm -hmm. it is an authenticity to know what you know and admit what you don't know mm -hmm. right and to be willing to open yourself to the thoughts, the ideas, the input of others, and not, you know, not think of yourself as the, the smartest person in the room all the time that has all the answers, right? Right. Um, so I think when leaders can do that, that is a big trust signal to others of like, oh, my boss is a person too. Right? <laughs> my boss doesn't think he or she's a know-it-all. Uh, my boss has questions and uh, is a lot like me. And so mm. the more that we can establish, leaders can establish those authentic personal connections with people, the more people perceive them as being trustworthy and, and worthy of giving their trust. And and what you just mentioned there as well is about, you know, being an expert in everything. I mean, the reality is today is you can't be. It's it's absolutely impossible. Right. Right. And therefore, you could be the leader of an organization. You can have, you know, somebody's working on your optimizing, you know, your outreach or SEO and all of this kind of stuff and search engine. You, you don't have a clue how to do that. So no. you have to find somebody who does know and you have to respect their expertise and trust that they know what to do. And I think that's the biggest thing now is that if you're trying to come off as a, as a know-it-all, you're trying to sort of be a pseudo expert in everything, that's about as inauthentic as you can be because yeah. it's impossible. Yes. I, I agree completely with you. The pace of change, uh, mostly largely due to technological mm -hmm. advances, right. And in, in our world, it's, it's absolutely impossible to be the expert in everything, right? Mm -hmm. And so you do have to lean on the expertise of your team members. And that right. requires trust, right? You've got to you've got to hire smart people, you've got to train people, you've got to develop their competence and their commitment on on their goals and their tasks, give them the right leadership style that they need and let them do their thing. Yeah. Right. And, and if you don't have uh, the right knowledge or skills to help them, leaders, we find others, other sources, right, that help people yeah. with that. We're, uh, we're connectors, we're problem solvers. We, we don't have to do it all ourselves. Yeah. And then the, the and, and part of it, too, is is the challenge of communication. Now, we already talked about the fact that 
you know, the, 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 the work world has been so radically changed in terms of how it's configured, you know, whether you got people in offices, hybrid, remote, virtual, long-term contractors, whatever it is. And we've also got five, and somebody even said six generations in the workplace. I don't know what the sixth is, but anyway. Yeah. Uh, so you have people with vastly different ways of consuming information. Yeah. So I think that is a, that's a big challenge as a leader is like, how do you communicate with all these different people? Because isn't consistent communication is a foundation of trust. Yeah, communication is the vehicle through which we build trust. Mm -hmm. right? It's through, trust is built through the behaviors that we use. What's a behavior? Something you can see a person doing or hear them saying, right? Yeah. So it's our behaviors that build trust. And if we want to be high trust leaders, cultivate environments of high trust, we've really got to hone our communication skills mm -hmm. to uh, to better connect with people and communicate with them. And, and the multi-generations in the workplace is a challenge. I think it's also a great opportunity. Sure. It's what makes makes our organizations wonderful and rich and diverse mm -hmm. and dynamic. Uh, and it requires a little more work from leaders to know that yeah. they've got to communicate in different ways to different audiences. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, it's a, it's a point because you made that point earlier and I think it's worth underlining is once upon a time, rightly or wrongly, uh, you, you could get your reputation based on your title, right? You can say, oh, they're the CEO or they're the senior vice president, whatever it is. Yeah. And that's kind of gone away because there's so much transparency and people have seen so yeah. much. As you said, they've seen bad actors, they've seen good actors, they've seen everything. But people no longer just give you that trust because of your title, right? I mean, sure. that has fundamentally changed. So if you don't realize that, as a, if you're still kind of relying on your title, you're not going to get very far. It's so true. There's there's a lot of close connections between the concepts of trust and power. And mm -hmm. the old leadership model was one of, I'm the leader, I have the power, everyone should trust me, I know what's best. Right? Yeah. Today's model of leadership is a partnership that we have with people. Yeah. That, yes, I'm a leader. I may have certain skills, knowledge, capabilities that have helped me be in this position. And my job is to come alongside you and help you be the best that you can be so that we all collectively succeed. And so it's, I, I think there's been, um, I don't know if this is a word, but I'm going to make it up a de egoing of leadership. Right. We've had to like get the ego part out of leadership a little bit to realize, hey, it's not all about you as the leader. It, yeah. It's about the people, right? That that get the work done. Yeah. And that and that then, you know, transitioned into the concept of servant leadership as mm -hmm. opposed to what you outlined earlier, which was kind of leadership by default and power mm -hmm. leadership, if you like. Um, you don't have the control, you don't have all the power anymore. Um, but the but talk a little bit about the concept of of, of servant leadership, because again, it's it's a term that's thrown around a lot, and I think it's not always fully understood. Yeah. There are a lot of misconceptions about servant leadership. Uh, when people hear that word, they often think, oh, well, that's that's some religious movement, right? <laughs> or they hear the term and they think, oh, that's that soft, warm, fuzzy yeah. style of leadership. Or uh, some think it's like no leadership. It's just abdication, <laughs> right? Let people right. do what they want. Um, mm -hmm. That's the Those are the furthest things from the truth. Servant leadership, there's two parts. There's the leader part, which is all about setting the strategic vision direction of the organization of the team. Here's where we're going. And then there's the service part. And as my colleague, Ken Blanchard has talked about for decades, that's turning the old organizational pyramid upside down, mm -hmm. right? To where now leaders, instead of being at the top of the pyramid, we're down at the base of the pyramid and we're supporting everyone else who is serving ultimately our customer at the top of that pyramid, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's an idea of leaders 
moving from being responsible for everything to being responsive to the needs of their people in the organization and helping them serve, you know, who our customers and clients are. So yeah. it, it's, it's this two part, there's a servant part, a leader part, but when you put it together, what it comes down to is servant leaders are valuing both relationships of the people that they lead, as well as the results that the organization mm -hmm. has to achieve. It's not mm -hmm. either or, it's a both and. Yeah. So um, a, a lot of it is about removing obstacles and setting your people up for success. And, and as you said, supporting them. And it's a very different, that's a very different dynamic. I just want to come back to what you mentioned there about soft skills. <laughs> I think that that's the worst thing that this, yeah. all this area, the worst thing that ever happened to her was it to be called soft skills yeah. because it made people go, oh yeah, soft skills, I don't need them. I push them aside. When in reality, yeah. these are the fundamental things that if you don't get right, can derail any organization. Uh, I 100% agree with you, John. The soft skills are really the hardest part of being yeah. a leader, right? Yeah, yeah. Anyone who's been hard should be called hard skills. Absolutely. Anyone who's been a leader for any period of time, especially the longer you've been a leader and the higher up in the organization you mm -hmm. you've moved, you understand, you know, your your technical skills, uh, you know, the finance stuff, the marketing stuff, the operation stuff, the project management stuff. That's that's one thing. We can learn, you know, mm -hmm. universities teach that in their MBA programs all the time. The, the interpersonal skills, the people skills, the communication skills, that's the hard stuff. That's where the work comes in. And yeah. uh, because leadership is all about getting stuff done with people, through yeah. people, right? Your spreadsheet mm -hmm. doesn't get the work done. It's your people get the work done. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and no, absolutely. And, and, and fundamental to it, like you just mentioned earlier, is the modeling of behavior, because you see now you know, a lot of organizations will have their mission and their vision statements and here's our values and all of that. But you, you but when you interact with that organization or when you talk to people from inside that organization, they go, it's not like that at all. Yeah. So uh, and, and that's why I think that's so incredibly important that people understand is at the end of the day, it's it's people take note of how of what you do, how you 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 model the behaviors. And when they see you actually living it out, then they go, OK, I can trust this person. Um, but you ha you have to be the one to demonstrate that. 100 percent agree. Trust is personal. It's mm -hmm. personal. We trust is such a ubiquitous word and um, being sort of a trust geek. Right. This mm -hmm. is where I spend my time. It always amazes me. There are over 100 commonly accepted definitions of trust when you look at the academic literature. It is so deep and so on. And so we use that word, you know, literally flippantly, right? Like, mm -hmm. oh, you trust this, I trust that organization, I don't trust the government, you know, whatever it is. But at its fundamental core, trust is a personal relationship. And if you think about it, when we say, oh, I trust that organization or I trust the leadership of my company, what it comes down to is we trust a specific individual that represents that, that generic entity behind that person, right? Mm. And so that's the imperative for leaders is you want people to trust your organization, they need to trust you. Because yeah. you are the organization mm -hmm. in their mind, right? Yeah, and I think no, that's and that's such an incredibly important point for people to realize that, yeah, the the trust in the organization emanates from the behavior of whoever is in charge and how that flows down through that's the right. organization. Because I think, um, Randy, I think we're and again, this may be a hangover from COVID or just whatever, but our antennas, I think, are up much more than they've ever been. And we're yeah. on the lookout for inauthenticity or lack of trustworthiness. Yes, yes I uh, I think that's right. You know, our, our brains are threat detecting machines, right? Mm -hmm. our, our brains are constantly scanning the environment and interpreting what's going on around us as, okay, is what's happening going to help me or hurt me? Right. Mm -hmm. And so we're almost because of the pandemic, 
that exacerbated it, I think. Uh, but because of this crisis of trustworthy leadership and things that we've seen, yeah, we're we're on the lookout for things that don't match our expectations. It's this, yeah. uh, you know, there's this process in our brain called reticular activation. Have you ever heard of that? No, no, no. Tell it's, me about. Tell me more. Well, have you ever been researching? A, a big purchase like a car. You're you're looking at purchasing a car. You finally decide on it. Let's just say it's a red Toyota Corolla, right? right? As soon as you get that car and you start driving around, you're like, oh yeah, holy cow! It seems like everybody else has a red <laughs> Toyota Corolla, right? Yeah, I, yeah. I never yeah. noticed so many red Toyota Corollas, and it's because what we focus on that's what lives in our brain, right? And I think we've been focused on untrustworthy leaders, people mm -hmm. that are not authentic, that we can't depend upon. And so we're on the lookout for them. And we see it in everything, whereas in times past, that wasn't as much of a concern, right? And, and it yeah. didn't hit our radar. So it's it makes it even a more important challenge and imperative for leaders to really model, like you've been saying, John, mm -hmm. we have to model the trust we want to see in the organization. Yeah. Yeah, and that's how I always say, uh, uh, Randy, in, in conclusion, you know, as we're coming into a political season again, is mm -hmm. is uh, you don't change people's minds by shouting at them and telling them they're stupid and they don't understand and they just need to listen to you. You yeah. change people's minds by being calm and just modeling behavior. If you yeah. see a happy and contented person who seems to be good, you go, I want to know what their secret is, right? That's exactly, <laughs> yeah. The the volume of your voice does not equate to the the logic of your argument, right? You know, it's like shouting exactly. louder doesn't make you any more right. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So listen, uh, as always, Randy, thank you for coming on. Like fascinating insights. Uh, all of Randy's information will be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about the work you do. Well, um, I work with the Blanchard Company. We are a worldwide leadership development firm. Uh, we help. Uh, organizations build their leadership capacity. Um, I focus my work in the area of building trust and servant leadership. We've been around for 45 years. We just celebrated our 45th anniversary. And wow. so if people want more information, they can check us out at Blanchard.com. Yeah, and I would encourage you, I mean, 45 years, that's fantastic. And, and as relevant as ever, if not more so. Yeah, it's yeah. been a real pleasure to connect with you again, John. Yeah, thanks, Randy. Thank you for watching and listening. See you all again soon.